Welcome to To Know the Love of Christ. Hi, and welcome back to To Know the Love of Christ. If you were with us on the last episode, then you know that we finished up Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 45, looking at Jesus' first recorded miracle, his preaching, and his authority. Today, we will be looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. So, at this time, if you would like, go ahead and pause and read those verses. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so let's go ahead and start with verses 1 through 12 of chapter 2. Do you all have anything to say? Well, Jesus is back in Capernaum. You know, last time he was here, he was doing a lot of healing. So now he's teaching and preaching, which I thought was neat. I never noticed that before. Brittany? The the first thing that I noticed when, when reading verses 1 through 12 was uh, the paralytic. And he's being carried by the by the four men. Um, and, you know, they, they opened up the roof. And most times when I read this, when I've, um, well, I guess maybe sat in assembly or have been taught this particular passage by other, by other teachers, you know, I, I often hear them say, they talk about the four friends. They make the emphasis on the four friends more than they do the paralytic. And they, they um, turn it so that it can be uh, taught about friendship of some sort. Like you, everybody needs to have a friend like this paralytic had. You know, and the fact that they were willing to claw open the roof of someone's house to let this man down in there. And when I was reading, I was like, you know, that's a good point. But when we look at verse 5, what I notice is, um, you know, it says that Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. So, yes, we notice the the faith of the four men, but we also know that the faith notice the faith of the paralytic as well. You know, I don't think we should discount the paralytic either and the fact that he had to have some form of faith on his own in order for Jesus to heal him and then in the manner in which he did. You know, so it wasn't just about the four friends. It was the the paralytic as well. So that's kind of what I what I had uh, noticed. He had to have enough faith to convince his four friends to do what they did. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting because when we when we look at it, um, that verse where he talks, verse five, it says Jesus when he saw their faith, and he started talking to the paralytic, and really the next verse, verse six, it starts talking about the Pharisees. And, I mean, we know this because we live later, but at that time, they would have been, obviously, they're the religious leaders, so people would have thought, like, that's who should have the faith right there. And it's Mm -hmm. this stark contrast. You know, verse 5, you've got these faith of these people we have no idea, but we know that they're not priests or any, well, we don't know that, I guess, but we can assume that they were just normal, everyday people. And then you look at the religious leaders of the day in verse 6, and they are in their hearts, calling Jesus a blasphemer, and they have no faith. Mm -hmm. And that is, I don't know, Jesus always notices faith, though. You think about the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 or Mark 7, which we'll get to that later, so I won't talk about that. And then the centurion in Luke 7, and he commends their faith, and it's not someone you'd ever expect. But I thought, like, Jesus sees our faith, too. Mm -hmm. You know, is he? does he marvel at my faith? Yeah. Does he say, look what she's been through? Like, wow, her faith. Or is he like, oh, you have little faith. Why are you doubting me? Like he often did his disciples. Yeah, another thing along that is I thought of James 2.17, you know, thus also, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So we hear his word. He's called the word in John 1, one. We hear his teachings and the reaction to that varies. So it could be, you know, one reaction is what these five people did, and another reaction is um, in verses six on. You know, there's they're combative, they're you know doubting, they're accusing Jesus of um, blasphemy. So, verses eight through nine, it's interesting. Like 
the battle belongs to the Lord. You know, he knows the motives of their hearts. He also shows his authority to heal in that verse, in verse 5, but he shows his authority in uh, verses 10 through 12 to forgive. So the authority to do, he's got the authority to do what he wants to glorify God. Also, like, if you look at verses 6 through 8, where you go through the whole dialogue of Jesus, knowing what they said in their hearts, I always thought that was kind of interesting. Like, they weren't amazed at that. Yeah, you know, I like, know. You can read my thoughts? Because that's what I would have been thinking. <laughs> but when I looked it up, it said that most Jewish teachers believe that prophets were given this knowledge. Well, we were talking about the paralytic and the faith that he and his friends had. And I just thought, like, if I if I were in the position of the paralytic, how embarrassed I might I might maybe be or not even embarrassed but like the inconvenience because at this point I mean we don't know if anybody else came to to be healed because based on what we read in in verses 1 through 12 it seems as if a lot of people were just coming to hear his teaching now obviously people could have come to be healed but you know we don't read that we only in this particular verse we only read about the paralytic and I just thought about putting that in practical terms today you know like are we willing to be embarrassed for the cause of Christ? You know, like you, you think about being inconvenienced for the cause of Christ and the, and the call, the call of discipleship, I believe, I know it's in, in Matthew and also in, in uh, Luke, I think it's Luke nine, Luke chapter nine. I'm not exactly sure the verses, but basically where Jesus tells the people like the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And you got to think about, the inconveniences and the different things that it's going to cause us or cost us to follow Christ sometimes. Like sometimes you might be embarrassed. Sometimes you might be the sore thumb, sore thumb, sore thumb, <laughs> sore thumb sticking out, you know. But if you believe that Jesus is capable of what he said he can do, if you believe in that and you have the faith like the paralytic and his friends did, none of that would 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 bother you. Or if it, if it did bother you, because we are human, if it did bother you, you wouldn't let it stop you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's something else I kind of thought about when, when reading and kind of thinking on that passage. Right, and not only did they inconvenience themselves, they inconvenienced others. Yeah. But we don't see the others grumbling about it. I mean, it very, I mean if someone came and tore up your roof, from what I found in the research that I did, the people that tore up the roof would be responsible for fixing that. Mm-hmm. After the fact, and it depends on what kind of house it was, um, but we can assume, I mean, it's probably a one-story home if they lowered him right into the room. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, not that we are looking for reasons to inconvenience others, but do we, you know, feel it okay inconveniencing others? And the church wasn't established at this point, so, I mean, I don't want to... I don't know that we can draw that parallel there, that this would have been the church they were inconveniencing, but they were inconveniencing people who were at least curious about Jesus, people that were seeking, most likely. So Mm -hmm. as brothers and sisters, are we okay with others inconveniencing us, like calling us at 2 a.m.? You know, we live next door to the church building, so we've gotten calls like, hey, can you let people in for a baptism? Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? And, you know, we don't mind. We've never really minded. But every now and then, it is like a real inconvenience. Like, <laughs> whoa, we're going to have to do some workarounds to get home in time or we're going to have to cancel something. But, I mean, when we think about it, like, it's always a blessing to do that. It's always mm-hmm. a blessing to see someone, you know, become a Christian or to help someone in need. Yeah. But do we look at it that yeah. way? Yeah. You don't, you don't, sometimes you don't think about stuff like that, you know. Uh, I just think about Hiram, Hiram, you know, and there have been times where he's been called 10, 11 o'clock out at night, you know, because somebody's going through something. And we all need to lean on each other, but it's, and, you know, keep it, keep each other encouraged and help to keep each other accountable and different things like that. But, you know, sometimes I really have to check myself because the carnal side of me says, you don't need Hiram Kemp at 10, 11 o'clock at night. There's nothing he can do for you. Whatever problem you have, I think you might be good to, like, figure it out on your own for the next couple of hours. But the spiritual side says, if it were Jesus, he would go. And my husband is trying to walk in the steps of Jesus. So, 
he should go. He needs to go, you know? As long as it's not a dangerous situation that we're walking into here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, and to break apart this roof was not an instant, instantaneous thing. You know, they had to have been making noise. They had to have been tearing it up for quite a while. And Jesus just stood there and watched. He didn't say, oh, wait, 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 hang on. What you doing? I'll, I'll come up there. Or he just watched them act out on their faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which again goes back to that that inconvenience. Not only did you interrupt Jesus in the middle of his teaching, but those who were curious about Jesus and those who came there to specifically, you know, hear him him teach. Mm-hmm. All right, so moving on, let's go verses 13 through 17, which here, this is where Levi is called, and Jesus goes and eats at his house, and the Pharisees call him out on it, and that's where we're at. Well, Matthew is what was a tax collector, and Jesus, again, is using that phrase, follow me. Right, and for those of you who don't know, Matthew and Levi are the same person. Oh, sorry. I didn't You're fine. Know. I said Levi. Which <laughs> well, that's how it is in a text. Yeah. But yeah, Matthew, Levi. Um, so being a tax collector, he was hated by his own people, probably his own family. But Jesus wanted him. You know, it's, it jo- goes to show you that th- you're not too far gone. You're, you, you may be hated by the world, but not by Jesus. Right. Well, when you think about Levi or Matthew, whichever you prefer to call him by, he, he was seen as a sellout Mm -hmm. like you're a jewish you're a jewish person and you're you're willing to work for the romans and not to mention like although he was a sellout he was probably a very wealthy sellout Mm -hmm. too you know you know he had money and so i just think about you know people have seen him as outsiders but um i just thought you know putting that in into practical terms today you don't really know what caused him to to want to become a tax collector. Maybe he felt like he was really good at it, or it possibly could be, too, that this was the only way he could really make a living for himself, make a living for himself to, to be able to take care of himself. Now, in the process of that, he you're right, Dee, he probably lost family. He probably lost friends. Obviously, we know he lost the respect of the Jewish people because they despise tax collectors. I mean... Uh, you know, he's almost like a leper in his own way, mm-hmm. you know, like we just have no dealing with them. But I also think it's amazing, too, how Jesus just says, follow me. And he just leaves and he just goes. And I'm like, well, you know, and I, I every time we, we talked about this, too, about follow me. And I don't know if we mentioned this before, but it just really made me think like the Bible tells us nothing uh, very um, detailed about the look of Jesus. And so I just really keep trying to wrap my head around the fact that what was so intriguing about Jesus that it just made you want to leave probably a wealthy job behind and, and everything else that you know at this point to follow, like what made you want to leave and just go up and follow him? Like it doesn't even seem like he had a second thought about it. Like what, what? I don't know. I can't wait to get to heaven to see Jesus for myself. But I really just like, what was so intriguing about him that it's like, he told me to follow him. So I'm going. No questions asked. No hesitancy. I'm, I'm going. That just always. And he said it. He didn't ask it. It's like, follow me. Yeah. So it's like this authority about him. Yeah. Like, did he see the same thing as the fisherman did? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And what I found speaking about tax collectors, is that not all tax collectors work directly for the Roman authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, It said that some of them might have been like customs agents charging import duties on items brought through the town. And for those kind of things, um, and I think also with farming taxes, like the money would have stayed locally. So it wasn't as much of a betrayal, but it was still a betrayal because they were taking your money even if these people didn't skim off the top, the taxes were so exorbitant that it wouldn't have mattered. But I did find something that I hadn't heard before that said that some of the tax gatherers were brutal. And 
they were free to search anything if they were assessing property, except for like physically doing a body search of a Roman woman. But some of them would go as far as to beat elderly women in order to get them to tell them where like their sons had gone to evade taxes. And it said that sometimes a whole town would move. Oh my. Literally pick up and move to evade wow. the tax gatherers. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's wow. I was extreme. surprised at all that, but I didn't, I didn't even think about it. I just thought, Oh, you know, like you hate the tax man, but no, like they were these people. They took it a little too far. A lot of the time, that doesn't mean that Levi did or Matthew. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that we don't know that about him specifically. But that would have been hmm. seen as a possibility for a tax collector. They were just despicable, and that's why they are equi- equated with, um, you know, the lowest of the low. From what else I found, the Pharisees um, and the tax collectors, the modern teachers of the time, would have pitted them against each other illustration wise like the model of piety of righteousness the highest you could go would be a pharisee and the lowest you would go the worst you could be like no piety would be a tax collector if you think it like preachers today you know Mm -hmm. and do that well maybe they don't do that (laughs) hopefully they don't let's hope not But like we we compare you know compare different types of people in society Mm -hmm. and i thought that was interesting but i mean when i look at this chunk right here like we talked about it before in a different episode. Mark's presentation of the gospel is shocking. It's challenging to the readers, um, you know, like as far as like culture and religion, the fact that he puts an account of demons in the synagogue, mm-hmm. you know, that would have been shocking to them. Jesus, in the same way, is completely counter- countercultural. So many people misunderstood him. The Pharisees would look at him and think like, why isn't he thinking like us? Like, why is he eating with these people? Because they took everything to the nth degree. And for them, they had certain rules about eating. And it wasn't just that they didn't eat with sinners. They didn't eat with people who didn't hold those same rules as them because they didn't want to, you know, filth. What's the word? Not filth. Uh, dirty themselves Yeah, up. dirty themselves. I was thinking desecrate, which doesn't, I know that's not right. But, like, they didn't want to tarnish themselves, you know, with that. And back then, it was like a kind of like an intimate relationship to eat with people at table that it wasn't just like, Oh, we're at a restaurant and you look friendly. Come sit with it. Like to eat at someone's home was very intimate and they're like twisting the principle here that instead of avoiding being influenced, they're going to avoid like they're avoiding influencing others. You know, it's like us saying like, well, we're just not going to be in the world. We're going to live to ourselves, and we're we're not going to associate with those people. Hmm. But because he was a religious teacher, he obviously should have agreed with them. Right. You know, yeah. in their minds. But I also, hmm. sorry, I also thought it was interesting that they ask the disciples here why he's doing it. They don't ask Jesus directly. They ask his disciples why oh, he's yeah, eating uh-huh. with tax collectors and sinners. And we're going to move on in the next episode. And they ask him about his disciples. It's like they can't directly. Don't you hate when people do that? They get all sneaky and they're like, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> hey, Dee, why don't you tell me about what's going on with Brittany? Like, it's like this backbiting, chattery gossip kind of vibe that I'm getting yeah. from them here. I just find that really... I found it interesting that they're all observing, observing. (laughs) That's my turn to make up words. They're all observing and reasoning about his motives. They're accusing almost of what, what is he doing? You know, that judgment. Yeah. You know, we, we don't want to do it all the time, but we're human. We make mistakes. And so we do do it. I love, um, I'm trying not to cross, you know, cross into other accounts too much, but I love the end of this passage here. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came to call, sorry, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. In Matthew 9, verse 13, um, it says, this is the same account. It says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call the righteous, not the right. I can't say that verse. I came not mm-hmm. to call the righteous, but sinners. 
I love where he quotes that from Hosea. I think it's Hosea 6.6. 6. I, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, which we talked about that last season. Mm-hmm. Mercy. And we'll get into it next episode about how their hardness of heart prevents them from desiring mercy. I love seeing how the different accounts lay it out and how they each have their own, I guess, tone or flavor, or whatever you want to call it. But the fact that he places that there, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he's talking, he's directly talking about what's going on right there. Like the fact that he's eating with these tax collectors and sinners. And that would have been like shocking to them because that's what they lived by was you, you do every little, like down to the jot and tittle of the law. It's all done or you are completely gone. Like I said, they misunderstood him. You know, we see the disciples, we see several different people that are looking to, to the coming of the Messiah and they're like, oh, he's going to save us from the Romans. And I think the Pharisees thought that the Messiah would come in and he would pat them on the backs and be mm-hmm. like, great job, guys. I've got it from here. Why don't you help me? You know, obviously we don't know what they were thinking, but I mean, if they knew that it was the Messiah, like truly knew, would they have acted how they did? I'm I mean, obviously it was in character for them, but I think because we talked about this, I think one of the episodes this season already, where in Acts, it says that other people have risen before Jesus' time, and so if this is from God, you know, we are talking about Gamaliel, right? Mm -hmm. If this is from God, do you want to be in opposition to him? No, but if it's not, it'll fizzle out just like the rest, and so... I wonder if the Pharisees held that view about Jesus at the beginning, like, oh, this is just another one of those guys that's calling himself the son of man. Um, It's not really, it's just going to fizzle out. And then once they see that it's not, they're angry, like, no, he's continuing this charade and, you know, basically blaspheming and the the penalty for blaspheming in the Old Testament was death. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to them, this would have been an egregious sin. Like, it would have been, like, I don't know if the worst of the worst, but I mean, it would have been pretty bad. They had the old law, right? They had, then that's what they were trying to uphold. So obviously they knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, they had information on David and different things like that. And it's like, you know, they would uphold those individuals. You think about Abraham and the fact that he lied not once, but twice about Sarah being his wife. You know what I mean? And how he and Sarah, um, tried to do things on their own it's amazing to me how they would uphold these individuals in such high esteem and they have such great mistakes you know but then somebody like jesus comes along and he's doing he he should be held in high esteem like he's doing great things right now uh because of their judgment and their and their hard hearts like they can't look past the fact that he's eating with sinners and pay more attention to the to the goodness that he is doing All right, well, it is time for us to find the love of Christ in the passage like we always do. I found it in Jesus' call to Levi when he said, follow me. Um, Because his call is a call to repentance, no matter how bad or repulsive we are. He saw something in Levi, like he saw in the fishermen, that he knew there was potential in them. He just to follow me. And he did. I like it. Brittany? Um, I I see it um not in the well, that's a good place where you saw it be, but I meant up <laughs> under that. <laughs> when when he goes to Matthew's house and he's eating with the sinners and everything, that's where I see the love of Christ because to love Christ is to love your neighbor as yourself, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, you know. And I think that's just a great reminder to all of us because I know there are there are times, I will speak for myself, that I have been guilty of, you know, judging individuals before I actually get to know them or feeling like we just don't look the same, we don't talk the same, like there's no way we're just going to be you know, friends. And immediately when I see my brethren, I should never think anything like that. I should always want to assume the best of anybody. And furthermore, never forget that 
just like Matthew was despised for, you know, for being a tax collector and just like Jesus is sitting at the, the table with these sinners, you know, I was one of them at some point, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't born saved, you know what I mean? Like, and I, and even to this day, I still make mistakes, but God says, it doesn't matter what you've done. You follow me and I will keep you, I will make you clean and I will make sure that you will continuously stay clean as long as you're willing to follow me. So that that's where I see the love of Christ. All right. I see it in that same chunk of scripture right there, Brittany, um, from 13 to 17, but particularly at the end uh, where, where they ask the disciples, why does he eat with, you know, tax collectors and sinners? It says, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, so Jesus answered them, and Jesus can always answer for me if I let him. I love Mm -hmm. that he does that. And then at the very end there as well, where he says that I came to call, I still can't say it, I came not to call (laughs) the righteous, but sinners. And right before that, he says, uh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I am very broken because I'm human. And I'm so thankful that he came to call the sick Mm -hmm. and to heal them. All right, that does it for today. Thanks again for joining us. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. We'd love to study with you or connect you to someone local to you. As always, we hope you will seek to know the love of Christ in your own life. Until next time, bye. 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 You can reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to click like and share this episode with family and friends. In doing so, you're sharing the love of Christ.